Turn with me now, if you would, 1 John, if you're not still there, we're going to continue and actually conclude our exposition of 1 John uh, as we're in the last paragraph, the last chapter in chapter 5. This morning marks really the 21st message as we've gone through this book for the last several months, as we've been going week by week, really, for the most part, verse by verse, hearing about the various themes and expounding those we've discovered in this book, things like fellowship with God, or the matter of hypocrisy, or the topic of light, and of course, love, these things that care characterize God and what it means for us as his children to walk in these, to walk in the light as he is in the light and to walk in love as he loves us, namely, of course, in loving one another. But as we saw last time, particularly as you looked at verse 13 of chapter 5, the whole book gets boiled down to that single verse. That this whole book has been about strengthening the faith of these precious believers. You remember, and we've belabored this, but there were false teachers that had come among them, teaching false Christs. And so doubts were creeping in, cracking and unsettling the foundation of God's people. That they were wavering in their commitment to Christ. And so then to battle that unbelief, to shore up the, the faith of the saints, he has been hammering in this book what you need to know in Jesus Christ. Namely, what you have in him. If you trust in him, you're in him. First point's been this. If we can remember, if we can see rightly our Christ, who he is, what's been provided for us in him, we would not then be tempted. We would not then be lured away from Him. We'd not be drawn away. You, you couldn't take us from Him, for we see how precious He is to us. In a very earthly and small parallel, really a poor analogy, but I think you'll understand it. In the morning, you cannot lure me away from a glorious, freshly brewed cup of black coffee. You just can't do it. I don't know what you could offer me that would have me drop that cup of coffee and grab something else. No, not even sugary treats. No. I want the black, the bitter coffee. What a gift of God that is. <laughs> Now, especially, I know, you will never lure me away from that cup of coffee if you offer me a glass of expired sour milk. Hmm. I had the unfortunate experience of drinking that recently. <laughs> Unknowingly. Hmm. Yeah, I like Greek yogurt. That didn't taste like that. <laughs> that was a whole new experience. But even if you just offer me milk, I like coffee way better than milk. So I'm not even going to turn down a good fresh milk for my cup of coffee. But if you offer me expired sour version of milk, that's repulsive on its own. I'm never going to go after that when I have coffee in my hands. Being satisfied with what I have is that I know it's best. Whatever other lures, calls, temptations, they have no pull. They don't even resonate with me. I just see them for what they are. That's disgusting. Why would I ever want that when I have him? And that's John's spiritual strategy here as he shepherds these people. He's pounding into their heads, extolling for them, holding up for them the excellencies of Christ. That the life and satisfaction and joy that's already secured for us in Him. Why would we want anything else? What could any other so-called God offer us? That Christ does not far excel. Security, He's got it. Life, He's got it to the full. What else do we want? And yet, that doesn't stop our enemy from trying, does it? And that doesn't even stop, sadly, our flesh from wanting and wandering. I mean, consider our first parents in the Garden of Eden. They were in paradise. They were in perfect fellowship for, with God. Everything was perfectly provided for there. They had perfect fellowship with the God who made them and loved them. And yet, it only took the serpent just first giving a question, a suggestion, and then an idea. We took the bait took the fruit and cut ourselves off from life itself. We bought the lie that God is holding back something from us. That there's something better out there. There's something more out there beyond God's provision, God's boundaries, and God's rules, God's world. So our hearts ever wander, wander from real life, from real truth, wander from God itself. 
so to strengthen us to combat this, John gives us these truths, these reminders about how great Christ is, what it means, what we currently already have in Him. For if we can sound that shore, if we can shore up that fortress, we will then not be tempted. It will not, it will come against us like the waves upon a rock. It will have no impact. We will not be lured. We will not drift because we have life in Christ. Here is how we battle the temptations and lures of the world and of the flesh and of the devil. It's to remember Jesus Christ. Here's the big idea. Know these three truths about the life we have in Christ. If you trust in Him, if you're His child, these are truths John's reminding us. This is what we have in Jesus. This is what we've been given. Remember these things, because that will then quench any flame of temptation, any lure of Satan, any pull of the flesh against us. So here are the three truths that he unfolds for us here. First, know that in Jesus you have sure protection against sin and Satan. You have security. Eternal, real security if you're in Christ. You have sure protection against sin and Satan. Second, we'll also see though we have a different relationship with the world. This helps us understand the, the lures of the world as they come to us. We understand our relationship with the world has been changed fundamentally. Because what it means to be now God's child. And then third, and chiefly, and what a capstone truth, verses 20 and 21. In Jesus we have life. We have a satisfying, abundant, real, eternal, unbreakable life. Through knowing Jesus, the true God. So let's see these truths unpack. First, know that in Jesus you have a sure, a solid, a real protection against sin and Satan. As we come to the end of this book, really the question is, well, what does it mean to have life in Jesus? And it means you have an indestructible, a sure, an unbreakable life that we can withstand whatever enemies, all assaults of sin and Satan in the flesh that come against us. Now the structure of this whole passage that we're looking at, verses 18 to 21, is really pretty straightforward. As this is the end of the book, this is his parting shot. You know, we say when you're giving a speech or when you're writing something, you want to leave them with something to remember. Here's what he wants us to remember. He doesn't want you to forget. He doesn't want you to waver. Here's what he wants this church to carry away with as they move away from this book. And he wants them to know, to be sure, to be certain, and to not forget. Look at verse 18. You see it in the beginning. We know, right? And then down to verse 19. We know that. And finally, verse 20 begins, and we know that. It's about knowing for certain. This resonates, right, with what we saw last time. Look back up to verse 13. Remember that? This, this is the, the central verse of the entire book. This is why he writes the letter, he tells us. And again, it's for the same word that so you would know. 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So you have to be in Christ. But if you are, know this, that you may know for certain that you have eternal life. This whole book's been about assurance. About knowing for real. 100%. Without a doubt. That you have life through faith in Christ. So now he's going to explain for us, well, what does that mean? And the first thing he says is this. What does it mean to have life in Christ? It means that you do not sin. You are no longer characterized by sin. You have a sure protection against sin and Satan. Verse 18. So here's the first we know. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. Here's the first thing we need to know. Those born of God do not sin, literally. But the ESV captures the sense when it translates it, does not keep on sinning. We've talked about this before, and John's done the same thing earlier in the book. The way he phrases this, John does in the original language, it's clear he's not thinking of a simple one-time event as if the one who's then born of God never ever again sins, which then would create this whole conundrum in our mind, well then if I've sinned, am I not a child of God, and do I repent to become a new child of God, how does this work? No, he's getting at not a single event, 
Because by the way, if you think, oh, I don't have any sin anymore, you need to go back and read the end of chapter 1, which says things like, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So that's not a game you can win either. But even the way he frames this, he's talking about the pattern of one's life. That's why the ESV renders it that way. It does not keep on sinning. This isn't the character, the pattern of the Christian's life anymore. The true child of God, he's not going to be perfect, but he will be different. He will be changed. His life will now no longer be characterized by sin. Rather, his life in the general direction will be characterized by life. The God's life in him. Or to use some of Paul's language, as God's child, sin no longer has charge or dominion over you. No longer. It's no longer your master. And that truth is so crucial, isn't it? Think of, again, back to last week, what we saw. So you just glance at, say, verses 16 and 17. We were talking about praying for our brother who was caught in sin. He was erring, wandering from the Lord. And yet we can pray for him with confidence, knowing, verse 16, that God will give him life. Well, well what's the, the foundation of this confidence? Why can we pray for our sinning brother who's wandering from God? How, how can we pray for him knowing that, that he'll have life? I mean, sin is deadly. How do we know this won't kill him? Though sin is deadly, and the believing, the, the believer struggling against sin, that may be true, but the sin he's struggling with is not to death because God will win and draw him. Why? Because it's in the very fundamental aspect of now what God's made him to be. He's a child of God. He can no longer go on sinning. We know that everyone who's been born of God does not keep on sinning. That's why we pray with confidence. That's why we know sin won't win. Now, we all know how strongly sin pulls on us. We all know something of these powers against us and how strong they are. So I see I'm supposed to be confident. I know the child of God won't keep on sinning. But how do I know that's true for me? And the sin I'm wrestling with. How do I know that's actually true for this professing believer on my right or my left? How do I know that my faith will hold? Well, that's what follows in the rest of verse 18. Our victory over sin, it's not grounded namely in us, but in who? It's grounded in Christ. Let's see this. Verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But, so here's the answer, he who was born of God protects him. Why can we be so confident? Because he who is born of God protects him, rescues him, keeps him, preserves him. Now, there are a couple different ways this phrase, he was born of God, protects him. There are a couple different ways that is understood or taken. And a part of, it, part of it has to do with the different Greek manuscripts that you're looking at. So, one way to take it is this. He who was born of God refers to the Christian, to the believer. And so then he protects or keeps himself. We could put it this way, that God's empowering his faith, that he would guard his faith. <coughs> That we, he would hold himself close to Christ. That's a biblical idea. We'll talk more about that. But it probably means otherwise, and as the ESV renders it here, he who was born of God, it doesn't say protects himself, as some texts read, like the King James, but it says protects him. Which then creates this question. Well, who is, who is the him being protected? Well, it seems to be certainly the believer. That's why he doesn't keep on sinning. Well, then, who is the one born of God? That's the question. Well, and traditionally through this book, as we walk through, we're referring to believers. That's how they're talked about, those who are born of God. But you'll notice this phrase is actually a little bit different. So look to the earlier part of verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God... It's in the perfect tense. Does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God, it's not has been, but just simply was, born of God protects him. He 
he's even the way he's phrased this, he's made a distinction. Every time you've gone through this book, First, first John, it's has been born of God. It's something that happened in the past and carries ongoing effects. Namely, God's spiritual life being put into him. But this is a little bit different phrase. He was born of God. Simply this, who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. The eternal begotten Son of God. That He's the one who protects Him, the believer. Keeps the believer. Prevents him from wandering. And I'm persuaded that's the sense here. Because this is our confidence. That we must know. We must know sin will not have the last word in our lives. And that's not based mainly on us, on our powers, our ingenuity, our righteousness, our passion. No. But it's based on Christ's continuing work for us. That He has endeavored, that He has purposed, that He is praying for, read John 17, to keep us. That's His mission. That's Christ's heart for you. And He will see it through to the end. He is the ultimate Son of God. That great spiritual older brother who keeps us, who holds us fast. This is our security. Its name is Jesus Christ. Who can resist Him? If He purposes to save you, to take you as His child, to be home with Him, who can resist Him? No one. No one is stronger than Him. Not even the most powerful and conniving of His enemies, the embodiment of evil Himself. Read verse 18 again. He who was born of God, the Lord Christ, protects Him, the believer. And you see the parallel here. The evil one does not even then touch Him. That's how strong Jesus' protection is. Even as Satan would reach out into assault, he can't even lay a finger on those Christ is protecting. He can't even touch us in the end. Oh, He's going to try. Oh, He's going to rage, and He's going to seek to terrify. He will tempt us. He will accuse us. He will lie to us. He's going to discourage us. He's going to tell you, you're too far gone. Christ can't still save you. As a fierce opponent, he roars and rages. And yet, we are promised in James, if we simply resist him, he flees from us. Why? Well, it's not because we are so strong. Satan then sees the power that's behind us. It's a power that he can't stand. Because it's Christ's power that keeps us, protects us, hold our faith fast to the very end. Now, in case you wish then to shrug any spiritual responsibility, I mean, it is all in God's hands after all, isn't it? Well, what do I even have to do about it? Well, understand, the very way, the actual means that God uses to keep us, to hold us fast to Christ, as they play out in your life on a daily basis, as, as, as He empowers and strengthens your face to actually hold Him. Let me show you how this works and what I mean. Turn over with me just a couple pages to the book of Jude. So go right in your Bible to the book of Jude. Because we see these two ideas of us holding on ourselves to Christ, keeping ourselves to Him, but then Christ behind us giving all the strength to make it so. Understand, there's an act of holding by us to Christ. But it's all motivated and enlivened by Christ's work in us. So it looks like this. Look at Jude verse 21. Uh, back it up. Verse 20. Jude 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. So we, we are active, engaged, building each other up, praying even for one another. We've seen that, right, in 1 John. To what end or what's the command? Here it comes, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Curious, isn't it? But here's the command that we are told... It's an imperative driven to us. Keep yourself in God's love. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. That's to be active. It's a command. We're to be, the point is, engaged in preserving our own soul. Hold fast. Hold on. The point is, it's going to be a hard road. Don't lose your grip. Lest you slip away. Don't become complacent. The risk is too great. Be engaged, fostering, sustaining your faith. 
worldwide to what end? I can't hold on strong enough. We'll keep reading. Then you come to verse 24, this great benediction of this book. Now to him who is able to keep you. Who has the power to keep you. And what's, he, what's his power to keep you and guard you? What's enabling? It's to keep you from stumbling. And so that he, by his power, he's going to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ. And I think that, that we say be glory, majesty, dominion. Amen. It's his power. But his power is working in us. And we're working hard to hold fast. And working hard to hold fast for one another. But this is our confidence. This is what we need to know. Though the world and sin pull so hard down against our faith, against our steps towards becoming more like Christ, our attempts to put sin to death, the world just keeps, and our flesh just keeps pushing against us. But in the end, we have a confidence that these efforts, these prayerful, feeble, weak efforts of our own, they will work because Christ is behind them, because Christ is protecting us, because Christ is in them. And if He has a hold of you, you will never be dropped. Keep fighting, brothers and sisters. Don't resign. With the help of Christ's power in your spiritual sail, so to speak, resist the devil, kill sin, and in Christ you have won. That's first. This is our confidence. This is what it means to have life in Christ. You have a sure protection against sin and Satan. But you also have a different now relationship with the world. You have a different relationship with the world. As Christ has singled you out, even as we heard sung about, if He's chosen you, protected you, called you to faith, and He's keeping you, you're different now. You're singled out from the world, and so your relationship with the world has totally changed. Your relationship with the world has now turned upside down. And he tells us this with these two complementary statements here in verse 19. Let's see this. Read verse 19 of back to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Well, well first again, you see that it starts with the word no. This is what it means to have eternal life. Know this. Don't forget. Hold this before you. And what's the first truth he has before us we need to know? No, we are from God. We are sourced. We've, in that sense, come out of God. Another way to say it is we are his children. He is our Father. The phrase, from God, it means precisely this in some other places throughout 1 John. But you can just go back up to verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God. It's the same phrase from verse 19, 4, from God. This means we're His child, we're His children. We've been made and included in part of this spiritual family. But we understand this is a spiritual family that we didn't start in. As we came into this world, this isn't where our spiritual family started. This wasn't the spiritual family we were first born into, was it? Because to be in this family, in God's family, there has to be a spiritual rebirth, doesn't there? You have to be born again. You can't be born physically a Christian. You have to be spiritually born as one. As Jesus told Nicodemus, right? That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. But prior to that spiritual rebirth, right? Along with the rest of the world, we were lying in the clutches of the evil one. That's the second truth he has for us. Verse 19. We know that we are from God. We're His children. We're, we're a part of His family. And the whole world, the entirety of it, and all of its inhabitants lie in the power of the evil one. The contrast is evident. We are from God, and the whole rest of the world is of the evil one. The whole world lies in His power. It's hard to see this. 
hard to reckon with this. I mean, God's a creator, a good creator. A good God who made a perfectly good world. But ever since Adam chose to follow Satan instead of God, the entirety of this world, all the persons born into it ever since, they are all, each one of us, under the evil one's sway, his influence, his lordship, and his family. And what does it look like when you're under Satan's lordship and you're in his family? Well, you live like he does. And what does that mean? In a word, sin. Look over at 1 John 3, verse 8. We see that the end of the book is really just drawing all these themes back in. 1 John 3, 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Or you could say he's a child from the devil. Why? Why can you characterize the one who makes a practice of sin with the devil? For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. You're living like your father. When you're born into this world under his lordship, you live like him. You sin. You rebel. You go your own way. You do your own thing. And we see that's the default position for everybody born into this world. Period. Save the Lord Jesus. To be born spiritually dead. Cursed. As Paul talks about, dead in our trespasses and sins. Following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. That's how we come into this world, and then that bent is vindicated a million times over in our own life as we grow and mature, and we just show a heart that is going against God. Over and over again, rejecting Him and His Word. Why? Just like the lie in the garden, we're looking for something better trying to find life in something else. Pursuing our own desires and ends. And all the while, Satan's just simply distracting us from the one place life is found. But there's hope even here. And you can see it or hear it in this phrase about the whole world. Though the whole world still lies under the damning influence and power, there is hope for any sinner of that whole world. No matter how egregious their sin, no, longer, no matter how long, say, you've been laying in your sin, unrepentant, just doing your own thing, even still, even if you have been giving the Heisman to God, there is still hope right now if you can hear my voice. There's hope with a God like ours, with a Jesus like ours. Because listen to this. That word whole world, or that phrase, it appears one other time in 1 John, and here it is. You know this reference, 1 John 2, 2. Speaking of Jesus, our advocate, the righteous one, He is the propitiation, the satisfaction of God's wrath for our sins. Oh, praise God for that, right? And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the, same phrase, whole world. All the world of sin is not too strong for our Jesus. He's not too strong for your sin, no matter how black it is. But you turn to Him. You turn to Him. You confess your rebellion. You confess your sins. And what do you discover? He is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. Not because you did anything. You just saw that you did it all wrong. And you saw that He was more than fully sufficient, the answer. This is our hope and proclamation that Christ is stronger. That in Him, even though we've been dwelling in death, there is still life. So when that's come true about us, when we've come to faith, and we still see that the whole world lies in evil, how does that change our perspective of the world? I mean, certainly a couple ways. But one, don't be surprised that you're an outsider in this world. When we were born, first off, we were born into the majority culture of this world. Born under Satan's kingdom and his influence as part of his family, the world of death. And that's the, that's the track we were grooving in. But now as God's children, plucked out from that, mercifully, praise God, plucked out, you're now part of the minority. 
Your desires, like God's, they clash with this world and its Lord. We should not expect in this world sway, influence, credibility, or affirmation from the world, then, should we? Peter framed it this way. 1 Peter 4, verse 4. With respect to this, they are surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery. You know, the old roads you used to go down, you don't do that anymore. What's going on with you? And then when you don't join them, what do they do? They malign you. They ostracize you. They're first shocked that you're going to try and swim upstream against what the whole culture is saying and doing. And then as you try and go against it, they mock you. Like Christian running from the city of destruction. As it was written in this book, 1 John, he said in chapter 3, verse 13, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. In this world as God's people, we should expect, you should expect to be on the outside, to be shunned, snubbed, rejected, blacklisted. Did our, did our Savior have it any different? That's normal when God is your Father and this world is still, in that sense, Satan's world. Don't chase the world's affirmation. That's true personally and individually, but let me say that church, okay? Grace Bible Church, do not chase the world's affirmation. Historically, every time the church does this, even under, even with good intentions, that every time the church tries in that sense to influence the world for Christ by being popular or being accepted, however you want to phrase that, historically, every time, the world ends up infiltrating the church more than the church does the world. We go with light into the darkness. Now, this doesn't mean we just pull out of this place. No, we're on mission here to engage, but to be in the darkness, and it's going to be hard because they don't like it. And yet we know it's not about exposing them for what they are for their own sake. It's about showing them the light that there's mercy to be found in Jesus Christ because He's a God who is greater and stronger. But if we find ourselves being enthusiastically courted or affirmed by a secular world, say a political party, be skeptical. Be tentative. Make that cooperation a loose one. Because we know, right? We know the world stands against us. Being from God makes us different. Makes us an outsider in this world. And they treated our Savior no better. And it really, as we see in Acts, it's an honor when we're rejected like He was. May He give us the strength to see this, to walk in it, with this new outlook, mission, and life, holding forth the one message He gives hope, which is Jesus Christ. As we're called out of the world, we look at it differently. That's what it means to have life in Christ. But also know this. This is really the capstone of the whole book. <clears throat> know that in Jesus, you have eternal life. You have it now. There's not a greater life out there. There's nothing beyond Christ that we can hope for or receive. And we have this life through knowing Him, the true God. So, of all things, this is the supreme takeaway that he wants ringing in your ears as you walk away from this book. That you have presently eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's true for every believer in him. That there's no greater life beyond him or life outside of him. And so then what? We must hold fast to him. We must cling to him. That's this third we know statement. So back to 1 John 5. Here's what we need to know. What we must not forget, and really it's built around four different truths he has in this final truth of verse 20. And what do we need to know first? According to verse 20, we need to know that the Son of God has come. 
And there's a whole lot of things we could say about the Son of God having come, about fulfilling promises and etc. But what's so crucial as you work through this book, what does it mean that He's come? Is that He came in the flesh. That heaven came down and took body to live among us, to be here. Now for what for? Why did heaven come down to us? Well, here's the second truth. Now, so we read in verse 20. Well, what was He sent on mission to do? And we know, verse 20, that the Son of God has come. So He's arrived, He's here in the flesh, and what was He here to do? And has given us understanding. So, so why did He come? He came to give us an, a mind to comprehend, to perceive the spiritual truths, to enlighten us. That we might be able to comprehend, to know something. For so we'll see someone. Well, what is he bringing us to understand and to know? And so we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. Now, first thing to realize, when it says that we may know Him who is true, that word know is not is a different word know than we've seen throughout the, at least the latter part of this book. The know He's dealing with here is a little bit different. It's dealing with the relational aspect of knowing. So, I know I've used an analogy like this before, so pardon it, but it, for me it really helps in illustrating this. We're not simply talking about knowing facts about someone, right? So, for example, I've read with great benefits tens of books from Mark Dever, which have personal anecdotes in them. I've heard scores of podcasts of him talking about pastoral ministry. I praise God for that. I've even met him like three times. Wow. Personally, like shook his hand and stuff. But I don't know him. I know for certain he has no idea who I am. And I don't, like, call him up. Hey, Mark, remember when? He's like, no, I don't. How'd you get my number? <laughs> I have no personal connection with him. But Christ came to earth, not just to give you facts about God, but to give you God. That he hears you. And you call upon him, so to speak, Poor analogy, but he answers the phone and says, I know you. I love you. I called you. In the word that's earlier on in the book, that so dominated this, this is what we talked about with fellowship. He's writing that they would have fellowship with the apostles because their fellowship is with God. They have this communion, this passing back and forth of a relationship. That's the idea of knowing here, to know Him who is true have a relationship with the true God. And that's the third truth we see. He brings them to know the one who is true, to know Him, the true God. Going back over again to verse 20. Because what we see is that Jesus didn't simply make this a possibility as an option, but He, for His people, accomplished it. This is incredible. Verse 20. Again, Jesus came to give us understanding so that we would know the true God. But then He adds, and we are in Him who is true. Look at that again. And we are in Him. Again, it's not that he made this relationship possible. As if, here's God's phone number, and you can text him if you like. He might even respond. No, he doesn't make it a relationship opportunity. He accomplishes it. He brings you and God into the room and actually turns the Father's heart toward you. That's what he's done. So that you are actually in him, in fellowship. Can you get any closer than that? He didn't make it possible. He made it. Accomplished it. Making peace. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ. Christ, the Son, came down from heaven to bring you into a relationship with God. And not potentially, but He has done it in Himself. For all that trust in Him. Through that death, burial, and resurrection. That glorious work of the gospel. He has brought you eternal life. He has brought you God Himself. And that's true. That is true, brothers and sisters. Regardless of how close you do or do not feel to God right now. 
Your relationship with God through Christ is as close and is as real as He is resurrected from the dead. That's objective reality in Christ. That's eternal life. But here comes this fourth and final culminating truth of verse 20 that just stuns us of this whole letter. And it's this, that He is Himself the true God. Look at this. If we're to ask the question, well, how could He so effectively accomplish this? How can we be so sure? Why is it this way? Well, because, the last sentence of verse 20, He, or literally, this one, referring back to the Son, He is the true God in eternal life. So how can it be that He so effectively brings you to know God? Well, because He is God. How can we be so certain that He gives us eternal life? Because He is eternal life. He is life because He is God. And despite your doubts, an unbelieving heart might be, have an allergy to think, oh, that this refers to Jesus. Remember who's writing this book. Who's writing this book? John the Apostle. Do you remember the way he opened his gospel? He's not afraid to call Jesus God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the implication of this, you get in with that Word, what do you get? You get life. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Why? Because he is the life-giving God, Jesus Christ. Now, there's life nowhere else. Life cannot be had outside of Him because He is God. He is life. And it's that context that then finally prepares us to hear the final command of this book. Verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Sounds like something that just fell out of Ezekiel and fell into 1 John somehow. What's He, de what's he dealing with here? Well, remember that these false teachers that were troubling the church, they, they were denying God? Not exactly. They were not atheists. They were even monotheists, worshiping the Jewish God. They were not avowed atheists. They just preached a different Christ. They preached an idol, a different Jesus, a false God. Because if you mess up, right, we've talked about this. If you mess up his humanity or you mess up his divinity, then you don't have Jesus anymore. You got something else. You got a false God. And the problem is, it's the only true God, Jesus Christ, that saves. So if you're holding on to a false one, a deficient one, you're in trouble. Because, yeah, it's promising you all the life in the world, but it only takes it from you. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, what are some idols that he has in mind that we might hold on to instead? Briefly, I just want to remind you of two in this book, 1 John. Let go of the God of self-righteousness and grab Jesus instead. Remember 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. There's this lie out there that God only loves me to the very extent I abstain from sin. So then I can't have any sin, which be means either I must redefine what sin is, or I just have to ignore it in my heart. <clears throat> Pretending or presuming, I, I just don't do it anymore. But the true God says, Christ says, see your sin, find your sin, own your sin, and confess your sin. Because there's no sin in you, Christ is saying, that on the one hand, I knew about it already. But more importantly, there's no sin in you that I cannot forgive, Jesus says. If you confess, He is faithful and He is just because He died for sinners just like you, He'll forgive and cleanse. The true God is stronger and His name is Jesus Christ. Or later on in chapter 2, throw down the God of security and the God of satisfaction in this world. There's a lie out there that life is found in the world and loving the world. That you can find life in all kinds of sensuality and pleasure and the lust of the flesh. Or that life is found in, in possessions, getting more things, building up security, having this great bank account. Lies. 
Those are all the world's lies. We know this, but how quickly we forget. No matter how hard you hold on to the pleasures and the things of the world, that momentary pleasure is going to slip through your fingers, and then you're going to need another. And you're going to need a harder one and a stronger one and need another. And why? It doesn't satisfy. It wasn't made to. It's to point you to the Christ who does. Or the treasures of the world we try and hold on to to protect us. They will break, they will fade, they will expire, they will become outdated. But the eternal God, Jesus Christ, says, I live forever. They tried to put me to death, but I conquered death forever for all who look to me. He will last, and He will preserve and keep all who look to Him. So little children, keep yourselves from idols. He is the true God in eternal life. Let's pray.